place. Guys, get in place. Welcome. Welcome to Church by the Sea. We are so glad you're here. And welcome to our 11 o'clock service just for you. We turned up the heat outside. Okay, so. As my, my friend Mark said, we invited Florida back to church this Sunday. So <laughs> glad they showed up. Anyway, we're so glad that you're here. There's a connection card inside your uh, program if you'd pull it out. If you're a first-time guest, please be brave enough to fill it out. And then we'll just, here's why. We just would love to send you an email or a letter just to say hello and introduce ourselves to you. Also, as if you're part of the Church by the Sea family, you know that this is the best way to communicate with the church family here. So if you have any kind of prayer requests or a change of address, just fill out that card. You can put it in the offering basket when it comes by a little bit later on. Or if you miss that, put it in any of our generosity boxes, which are the black boxes on the wall by the exits. Put it in there. We'll make sure that it will go to the right person on staff. So, yeah, we're so glad you're here. Uh, just to let you know, we, we're starting a new class. It's actually during this service, and if you want to leave to that, you can. But um, <clears throat> uh, our friend Corky is teaching a class on the Hanukkah and how that's connected to the end times. And so he, he's an Old Testament scholar. He just loves that. So anyway, that's happening starting this this uh, week. And um, also, if you're interested at all, or if you currently serve as an usher or greeter, welcomer, uh, we're going to have a luncheon after next Sunday evening. I'm sorry, Sunday afternoon. So about 12.15 after the service, we're going to have a luncheon, and we're going to just sort of get a little bit more organized. If you're interested in being a part of this, which is fun, it's a great way to get to know some of the folks, come join us. And also, if you are already a part of that team, come and uh, we'd love for you to be there. So anyway, it's some of the news, we got other things inside the program. Look through it. We want you to be informed, but we're so glad you're here. If you would stand up, let's say hello to each other. Get to know some of the great folks around you. see you, buddy. All right, and let me have our opening prayer, if you would join me. Lord, we are so thankful for your grace. It reminds us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is sufficient in every way. And Father, we thank you that our steps, Lord, for our life are established by you. Lord, even when we try to run away, get off track, you're so good to allow detours to bring us back to your will. Father, we know that you love us and that you delight in us regardless of how we perform or behave. Lord, today we rest in the sufficiency of Jesus, in the trustworthiness of your word, and the completeness of your Holy Spirit with whom you have sealed us forever. Lord, may we become the confident, faith-filled sons and daughters that you've created us to become. May we be bold May we be humble. And Lord, may we be faithful as you are to us. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Maybe seated. But isn't that good? New Year's resolutions will fail you. You know why? Because it's on you to perform. We're horrible. We don't. We mess up. But God is faithful. And as I just, I'm ready to preach now. So, but first, uh, we're gonna have our offering. So, if uh, you would get your gifts ready, and just let you know, when when we return our tithes back to the Lord and give offerings, you know, it goes to support all the different ministers here, certainly. But uh, we're also showing God our faith. Now, we're, when we give that, we're like, God, I don't know how we're going to make it stretch out. But that's another area that God gets very real to us, and he allows us to see how it does stretch out. Please, ushers, come. And as they're coming, let me pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. And, Lord, even in the areas of finances, you prove yourself over and over. Thank you for that. God, we ask that, uh, you know, Lord, you show up in our lives, that you would really move us to... You know, God, I want to experience more of you and to be more faithful in all the different areas that you call us to. And Lord, bless this offering, we pray in your name. Amen.
I love it. Eddie, I love watching you play. You know, if you, you may not be able to see him because he's sort of facing this way. His eyes are closed, and some may interpret it as if he's like looking, trying to figure out what notes am I going to play, like what's next to the song. He's not. He's just feeling the song and going with it. He's making it up his own. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. That's the way to, mm, I love it. All right. Hey, we're in this, this series called Rooted, and, and really it's, it's a series that is about spiritual renewal, and, and because the premise that we're laying out is that we want 2018 to be different than 2017. And so often we allow years in our memories to be de determined by what happened. You know, what tragic things happened or did you get married that year or what? And, and so we just allow circumstances to dictate if a year was a good year or not. And I don't think that's how God wants us to live. Um, and the idea is that if we can become more Christ-centered this year, intentionally focusing on Him, putting our roots down in Him in every area, that, that will make a difference. That's the hypothesis, okay? And I get this from uh, this verse. We can have it in the screen. It's from Proverbs. <clears throat> it says, wickedness never brings stability. And, and you may think, well, I'm not wicked. Of course you're not. But we're all selfish, right? And when we begin to do things, make our own plans, with, regardless of God, it's never stable, you know? And, and we don't know what's going to happen. And ooh, did we, what did we say to her that we got to repeat the same story to him because, you know, we don't want to get caught in a lie or a little bit of a twisting of the truth. And, and so we, we can just get off track how we should. Wickedness never brings stability, but the godly have deep roots. And the idea is that we're established, that our life, the foundation, how we make our choices and our priorities and our values, they're established through God and his word. And if we can do that, I believe 2018 will be different. Now, I know many people, we think, well, we're good with God. You know, we come here Sunday morning, or maybe you have a home church where you live, and but Monday, you just sort of get into the autopilot of life. You know, you go to work, come home, eat, go to bed, and do it again. And this is sort of the routine. Many people, they just get to the end of their life. They're going, okay, we're going to retire. And you sort of and make those plans. But you're just sort of following the flow or the path of the world or really our culture that most people do. And I don't think it's how we should live. God, if you're breathing, God's got a purpose for you. Now, it may not change the world, but it will be to change someone's world. Because God wants us to influence other people in some way. So that's where we're going. Um, <clears throat> let me show you. The next slide is a map. We're going to be talking about some kings. And this is Old Testament uh, Israel. You see right there in the middle is that big yellow or orange area. More yellow here. <clears throat> that's the northern kingdom. The red part below it, that's the southern kingdom. And so at this time in the history, around 600 B.C., there's a divided kingdom of, for God's of the promised land. Today we're going to focus on the southern kingdom, and uh, it's called Judah. That's like the premier place because that's where Jerusalem is, the temple. And so all of their religious life, you know, their, their ceremonies, and just their aspects of obeying God is all connected to Jerusalem. So we're going to look at some kings here because we're going to see, yeah, there's some good kings and some really, really, really bad kings. And I think there's going to be a... a a lot we can learn. So we're, you see the guy at the bottom there? That's Josiah. That's our main guy, but we're going to back up four generations. <clears throat> Let's look at the one there at the, towards the top, Hezekiah. This is his great-grandfather, Josiah's great-grandfather. He was a godly king. When he took over, Israel was not a godly place. He reestablished the temple. He cleaned it up, and uh, he destroyed the idols that were in the land. Okay, next we go to his son, Manasseh. Uh, this is so Josiah's grandfather, a bad, bad guy. Let me read to you some passages from Second Chronicles, a couple of verses, that describes this guy. He rebuilt the high places that his father, Hezekiah, had broken down and erected altars to Baal. So his dad, right, Hezekiah, tore down the bad stuff, while his son, just the next generation, went and rebuilt the very things his dad tore down. Then look at verse 4. He built altars in the house of the Lord. In the temple, this cat built altars to Baal. And then it gets better. Verse 6. And he burned his sons as an offering. Can we all agree this is a bad dude? He's not misled. He's not misunderstood. He's evil, right? Okay. 
And then look, it says here, he used fortune telling and omens and sorcery and dealt with mediums and necromancers, which is another word for wizards. All right. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Again, if you're God, I'd be pretty ticked off too, right? But here's the good news. He repented. Towards the end of his life, he realized that's wrong. And again, I'm sure because of things that he saw and heard from his dad, he finally trickled down and penetrated his heart. And so he began cleaning up. Like the, the things that he built, he cleaned out. Now, not in all of Judea. Remember, Judea is the big territory. But in Jerusalem, he didn't live long enough to clean out the whole area. But he cleaned up Jerusalem, cleaned up the temple. Okay, so now we're into the next uh, king, which is Amon, Josiah's father. He, he did what was evil in the Lord's sight as well. So though his dad turned around and repented and got things right, he did not. And he sacrificed to all of the foreign idols that his, his dad you know, tried to get rid of. Now here's a telling story. We don't have a whole lot of details on this guy, but here's all you need to know. <clears throat> Amon was assassinated by his own men. No, that's never a good sign. But here's the thing. They knew that, okay, if we get rid of this king, you know who's going to be king next? It's his son, Josiah. Josiah is eight years old. Now, have you ever been at a job? You are such a horrible boss that your team members want to kill you and would rather have your eight-year-old son replace you. All right? You don't do a whole lot of eight. But if they would rather have him <laughs> being their boss than you, that says a whole lot. Okay, so that's what happens. They assassinate him, and poof, there's Josiah, eight years old. Okay, let me read to you a couple of verses about Josiah. It's great. Uh, this is, again, around six, the second half of B.C. of 600, so 640 to 600. Verses, Second Chronicles 34, verses 1 through 2, tell us about Josiah. He was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, and he followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what is right. I don't know any eight-year-old you could say that about, right? He didn't turn away. Are you kidding? There's a lizard. He's going to turn away and go chase the lizard. I mean, eight-year-olds do those kind of things. But what a great testimony he didn't turn away from doing the right thing. I would love for people to say that about my life when I'm 68, right? What a great thing to say. But notice it doesn't say he's following God. He's following his ancestor David, King David. So he, that was the model. That was what he knew about was King David. He was probably a hero in his sight, you know? So he followed the lineage. Again, wanted to be like King David. And, and he is unswerving in character and integrity. And again, I love, he did not turn away, not in times of temptation, nor in times of trial. Man, would that be a great thing for us to be able to say about 2018? We didn't turn away in times of temptation or trial. So let me read to you verse 3, because it talks a little bit more. During the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, obviously, 8 plus 8 is 16, Josiah began to seek God, the God of his ancestor David, so, again, before, he's just sort of following the model of David. That was his heart. He knew that that was the person to really go after, to try to model your life like that. But then age 16, he embraced God for himself. Like, he understood what a relationship with God was all about. Okay, and it gets, life takes, it goes even better. All right, so this is the time he really became a fully devoted follower of the Lord. So, verse, the second half of that, verse 3. In the 12th year, so he's 20, in the twelfth year, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem, right, the whole area, plus the city of Jerusalem, destroying all the pagan shrines and the Asherah poles, which are wooden poles used uh, to honor the Canaanite fertility goddess, and the carved idols and cast images. He ordered, right, gave the demand, that all the altars to Baal be demolished and that the incense altars, which stood above them, be broken down. He also made sure that the Asherah poles, the carved idols, and the cast images were smashed and scattered over the graves of those who sacrificed to them. And he burned the bones of the pagan priests on their own altars, and so he purified Judah and Jerusalem. Now, this guy was serious, wasn't he? 
Like, okay, let's dig up those old guys. We're going to burn their bones, you know, like, because being dead's not enough. We got to burn them on the altars, you know. Like, wow, that's like a little over the top here. But I think it's a picture of how serious he took. Because he didn't just say, okay, we're just going to tear down the, the altars. We're going to do this in such a grand spectacle kind of way that everyone knows exactly where we're standing. We are destroying them. Dig up the bodies. Let's burn the bones. All right. So he re, he's, again, making a large, loud statement with this. And this had basically been the state religion off and on for 70 years, this idolatry. And at 26 years old, Josiah says, all right, we got to clean up this temple. They get the Baal altars out, but not just remove the purity. They got to clean it up. You know, they're, they're, you probably have closets that every now and then, it's just time to clean up, don't you? We do it around here, let me tell you. <laughs> we got to clean them up. It, you know, just stuff just accumulates, dirt. And that's what they had to do to the temple. They had to clean up. And in this, in some corner, some little nook and cranny, again, that they hadn't seen previous, they found a scroll. And it's a pretty special scroll. Let me show you. Verse 15, Hilkiah said to Shaphan, the court secretary, these are leaders in the temple, he declares, and I love, this is the New Living Translation, it has an exclamation point, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple, exclamation point. This is a big deal, let me explain why. In the, ori the original language of Hebrew, how it's written, it's written different, because there's lots of places where it says the book of the law, the book of Moses, right, all throughout Old Testament. Here, it specifically says, the book of the law by the hand of Moses. This, I mean, it, the scriptures indicate this could be like the original one written by Moses. So this is a big deal. And they find this and they're going, what? You know, like, this is amazing. Like, they haven't seen this in years. And who knows how many, they've never seen it. But generation after generation previous, never seen this. They just had copies of it. So a huge find for them. And, I mean, here's what it means. It's talking about the first, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. So it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay, five, the first five books of our Bible. And here's what it says in verse 29. Then the king, okay, after they got this news, he summoned all of the elders of Judah, right, the whole area, and Jerusalem. And it says, And the king went up to the temple of the Lord with, I love this, all of the people of Judah and Jerusalem. So it was an instant road trip for everyone outside. They had to get there. They had to go to, this place, to Jerusalem, to the temple. It says, along, along with all the priests and the Levites, all of the people, from the greatest to the least, there... The king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took his place of authority beside the pillar, and he renewed the covenant of the Lord's presence. Let me stop there. Can you imagine? I mean, you get this order. You, we all have to go to Jerusalem, and you get there, and so it's just full. He says, all right, everybody, we're meeting here at 1 o'clock or whatever. They get everyone to the temple, and he begins reading the first five books of the Old Testament. Now, the good news for you is I'm not going to do that this morning, all right? This is not a 20-minute sermon. He pulled out on his iPad, read all five books. Whew. Now, I mean, imagine if that, you'd be like reaching for mint, something. I'm hungry. Like, come on, dude, hurry up. Because it, it was a long, long, long time here. But he did that showing the importance of God's word. And then it says, um, there the king read to them the entire book of the covenant. That had been found. Verse 31, the king took his place of authority beside the pillar. I already said that. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all of his commands, laws, and decrees with all of his heart and soul. He, <coughs> Scott, excuse me, <coughs> as I choked to death. <coughs> he promised to obey all, <coughs> obey all of the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll. And he required everyone into Jerusalem and the people of Benjamin to make a similar pledge. So Josiah's going, we are going to do this. This is our covenant. We are renewing it. We are the God's people. We are going to do it. And it says all of the people also made the same pledge. 
And it said the people of Jerusalem did so, I love this, renewing their covenant with God, the God of their ancestors. All right, there's, that's the story in a nutshell. Four generations of kings, some horrible, some sort of good, but Josiah, the one who came to power eight years old, made a difference because he refused to give in to what was wrong. Really, this whole series is on spiritual renewal. You know, for us, that's what I hope 2018 will be for us as a church family. And if you're just visiting, I hope that will be yours. That 2018 will be a great year. And it has nothing to do with who's in the White House or the economy. But that God is doing great things in you. And you recognize that. Spiritual renewal. Reaffirming our covenant with Him. And how God is good and holy. And it's really talking about the doctrine of lordship. And what that means in theologians, they would talk about who is the Lord, the boss, the leader of your life. Now, for us as Christians, it, it needs to be Jesus. And I know many of us, you know, we prayed, we've asked Christ into our life, forgive us of our sin. We, we know we're, we're good. We know we got heaven coming up. But it's very easy to just go about our normal routine of, well, that's just the way I go to work, and that's what I do after work. And, you know, by the way, I just, after work, I'm tired, or I'm been a hard day, I deserve this, or I deserve to go here, or I deserve, you know, we sort of compromise, perhaps. And, and we're not like Josiah, who was committed to doing the right thing no matter what. And I, you know, I want to show you three aspects of how we can experience spiritual renewal in our personal lives. And it'll make sense. Number one, I must uproot all that is unholy. We got to get rid of it. Now, you might think, there's nothing unholy in my life, and maybe there isn't. But there are certainly things that if you removed, God would be able to do something more in your life, right? Television is not a bad thing, but if you watch it 18 hours a day, okay, you know, you could probably do with less of it, right? We all have these things, and, and for many people, they are stuck where they are, because they're still holding on to things they shouldn't be holding on to. Let me read to you a verse from 1 Peter. Peter says, it, and this is great for our heart, get rid of all evil behavior. And as the theologians here at Church by the Sea know, that in the original language, the word all means all. Yeah, all, every. And so it says get rid of all or every evil. It means literally get rid of all or every <laughs> evil behavior. Okay, then it says, be done with deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, any unkind speech. Then it goes on. There's a list there. But <clears throat> many of us, we're holding on to something. And I, and I, I've had seasons in my life where I've been like that. God's going, you know, son, we have worked and worked and worked. And I brought you to here. But until you let go of this, we really can't go any further. Let it go. And we have that struggle. <laughs> And we're going, but God is not really wrong. They do it, or I've always done it. Grandma said I could do it, right? And it's, and God's going, I understand, I understand. They can do it, but I'm talking about you. You need to let it go. And until we do, we're just, we're stuck. We're staying there. You know, I know there's lots of different areas where that can really affect us. For some, it's relationships. You know, there's someone in our life who is a negative influence in us. They may not be bad, but it's just someone we should not be spending that much time with. I had a guy who was, he was in my band. I loved him. And, but I just, I, Lord showed me, I cannot hang out with this guy too much because his humor and my humor, again, both sarcastic, we can be saying things we should not be saying. And it's not to be mean, we're just being silly, but again, it's an influence. Some of us have people in our lives where, to be honest, we're codependent. Like we think, if I don't fix them, if I don't jump in and fix that situation with my, my child or my friend, then who's going to do it? And you know what? It, it's keeping us stuck because we're not going forward. We're stuck there to another person. For some, it's bitterness or jealousy or we have these thoughts of revenge that just sort of keep emerging themselves in our mind and we're thinking... It's justified because they hurt me. You know, it was unfair. It was unjust. But we still allow this bitterness thing to stay there. Our jealousy, 
or wish that we had something that we don't have. And again, that occupies our thoughts. And again, it's giving that person or that hurt a place of prominence in our soul. You can't have Jesus sitting on the throne when we got bitterness there. For some, it's pride. They're, you know what? They, they have goals. They want to they go get life. And they're ready to go after it. But here's the truth. They got great goals, but they don't want to do it for themselves. They want to do it because they just want the, the recognition from someone. They just care about what do others think about me. And again, that's it's not good. For some, it's a substance. It can be alcohol, tobacco, food, shopping, whatever, pornography. I mean, there's all sorts of things that if we're in a bad place, we can add them. And they may not be bad, but they can still have control of us. And so when that happens, Jesus is not sitting on the throne. He's not leading our life. We say, yeah, we love Jesus. He's good, but sit over here right now because I'm going to eat at the buffet. All I can eat, you know, and we're celebrating whatever, the Golden Corral. <laughs> Woo! And if you're thinking of going there after church, don't go. The commercials look awesome, but the food don't taste like it should. <laughs> and if you work for them, I'm so sorry you're here. <laughs> All right. So we got things we need to look out for. I want to tell you, I got a story about a guy who he came to me after church. He's a friend of mine. Let me, let's show that next picture here. He gave me a gift after church. And if you can't tell, that's a little black bag. He gave me a black bag. I'm like, oh, thanks, bro. I thought it was a gift. It's a little thing of marijuana and some kind of white powder and a pipe. I'm like, wait, wait, it's not my birthday. What? <laughs> and, and I'm like, dude, what's this? He's like, I'm giving this to you because I'm giving it to the Lord. I'm like, what? So you get the backstory. And here's this, you know, he's a guy who's struggled with depression all his life. Super nice guy, wonderful husband, dad, always doing his best. I mean, just tries, tries, tries to please others. And, and he struggled with depression, and he said, man, smoking dope is the only thing that would just help me get through the day. And he said, but I know, I know that I can't have this anymore. And he was just really struggling. Again, it, he had done this for years and years and years daily. And um, so I just celebrate. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome, you know, and I thinking, I can put this stuff on my desk as a great trophy of God, and then my friend's going, dude, you'll go to jail if you have that. I'm like, whoa, okay, probably not a good place. So I gave it to Johnny, and <laughs> no. I'm teasing. No. <clears throat> so I actually took the substance and like sprinkled my plants outside, let them enjoy it, I guess, whatever, and then smashed the pipe, you know, and threw it away. But I, I wanted to grab a picture because what, this is uprooting something that should not be in the guy's life. And it's not because some preacher was yelling at him about it or people were getting us. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He'll convict. And you know what? He had all the excuses of why he should keep it in his life. It's worked for him. But he knew that if he doesn't let go of it, he can't move on. I'm so proud of him. Here's the great news. And, and was it, anyway, just a few months later, you know what? Here's the truth. His depression's all gone. And he is now helping others get off drugs. You know? That's a God store right there. <clears throat> He's not a fly by night guy. This guy's been living it up for, for years. It was a real change. It was a moment of change in his life. All because he was willing to get rid of it, to uproot the evil. In his life. Now, all of us have something. Now, it may not be evil, but there's probably something that may be out of balance or something. Is there anything you think, boy, if I would just limit this, or if I wasn't involved with this, that would allow God to do a greater work in my life? I'm sure there's something. I know for each of us, we have different seasons where God will reveal stuff, but man, when we uproot what shouldn't be there, that's the first step to spiritual renewal. The second step 
is to personally embrace God's word for my life. What I loved in our story with Josiah is that he didn't just call the priests or the religious people or the government officials. He called everybody, and he gathered them. And here's why this is important. God's word is for everybody. It's not for the religious guys or those who wear fancy robes or preachers. It's for us. God wants us to know his word. In there, oh my gosh, I mean, it, it changes everything. Here's the problem. Though we have more access to God's word than ever before. I mean, my goodness, we have it on our phone, right? You know, back in the day, a family had a family Bible. One copy. I don't know how many copies I got. And that's not even including what's on my computer and on my phone and all that. It's everywhere. However, America is more biblically illiterate than we ever have been. People don't know God's word. We think we do. Like you got, I'm sure you got friends. They'll, they'll give you some kind of cliche or bumper sticker saying, you know, they think, yeah, that's in the Bible. You're going, no, man, that's Mother Goose, buddy. You're sorry. You're missing that one, right? We don't know God's word. And... It's impossible to have spiritual renewal without a commitment to God's word. It says here in 1 Peter, like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk. Watch. So that you will grow into a full experience of your salvation. You can be saved and not know God's word. You know what I mean? You can know God loves you and he, Jesus died for you and he took the punishment that we deserve. But God wants you to grow into the full experience of your salvation. He wants us to grow. And a part of that is we've got to put roots into God's word. We've got to know his word. And it says, cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Like there's so much to unlock in God's word. You know, God's word will comfort us. It will strengthen us. It will encourage us. You know, there's been many times where we're going through a difficult time, whether it be a trial or temptation, and I can pull up a Bible verse in my head because I've read it that I'm able to do the right thing. Just like Josiah, he stayed committed to the right thing. God's word is that strength, and it should be the foundation for everything we do. Again, the problem is when we just think about God on Sunday morning and then we go about the rest of the, you know, the way of the world during the week. We miss out on what God has for us. God, God's word has a lot to say about finances, about relationships, about how do we handle the pressures and stresses of life. Like the more we know, the more we'll understand what is God's will for us. How do we act? So that's the second one. We need to know God's word. The third truth, I get this from the, this story, that will be vital to our spiritual renewal is number three, that I would reaffirm the vows of my covenant with the Lord. I would reaffirm the vows. That's what they did. At the end of reading all five books, they all said, we, they reaffirmed their vow, their covenant with God. Second Corinthians says this, such is the confidence that we have in God through Christ, meaning because of what Jesus did. By ourselves, we are not qualified to claim that anything comes from us. Meaning we can't take credit for it. We pulled off a good thing. Wow, celebrate it, but understand it's not really you. Here's what I love. Paul says, we are not qualified to claim that anything comes from us. Rather, our credentials come from God, who has also qualified us to be ministers of a new covenant. You know, here's what I love about this. God didn't just come give us this covenant of forgiveness and fullness of life for us, this agreement, this promise, so that we're cleaned up and we're good. But so that God would actually not just clean us up, but then make us qualified to serve others, to help them become a part of the covenant. That's God's purpose for your life. You're breathing. God wants to be at work in you, cleaning you up, maturing you, putting your roots down in him so that you're influencing others. That's 2018. God wants to use you to be a minister of this new life that you have in Christ. And you may not change the world, but you can change someone's world. Give them your time. Give them your attention. Give them God's word. Befriend someone. 
I believe 2018, the, the best is there's still so much that God has for us. But are we willing to uproot the evil? Let go of the stuff we need to let go of. When we spend time in God's words, we better understand him and, and what he wants for us. And then will we reaffirm the covenant that we have with God? Again, a covenant is not based on you. It's based on what God and his faithfulness is. That's what's so amazing. And every week, I try to have some kind of prayer towards the end because I want to give everyone an opportunity to know that you can be forgiven by God. And it has nothing to do with what you did last night. Like, none of us perform good enough. That's the whole point of why Jesus came. Like, if any of us could have pulled it off, Jesus said, well, you know what? They're on their own. They can do it. I don't need to do it for them. But he came to earth and he died. He took the punishment that we deserve for our independent living from God. Right? You may not even be bad, but you still made choices that didn't involve God. You did what you wanted to do. And God wants our relationship to be so close that it's like this ongoing consulting and relationship and loving. And, and in order to get rid of the stuff that we've done, the penalty and all that, Jesus died for. He took the punishment so that we don't have to. And the only thing that's required is sincerity. That's, that's why they call it faith. You're trusting God that what he said is enough. And by sincerity, you're saying, God, I believe in what Jesus did in the cross, that he died for the sins, and I want that for me because I'm tired of living the way I have been. I want you to lead my life. I need you. And I trust in what Jesus did. That moment, it's like the moment that you become born again is what Jesus said. There's something happening spiritually that goes on. It's like you turn on. You become alive. And then from that, for, that point forward, the Holy Spirit's in you. You begin to change little bit by little bit. God changes your attitudes, changes the things that you want to do. And to now you're doing the things that you want to do what God wants and don't want to do the things that you used to do that hurt God. And again, it's him working out his life in us. All that you need to do is not sign up for a class, is not pay thousands of dollars to the Church of Scientology or anybody else. Trust Jesus. Let him do the work in you. I hope that you will truly consider that if you have not. If you would bow your heads, please. And make this the moment. If you've never fully embraced Jesus, let's do it. Come on, put this flag down in this moment on January 21st. Say, dear God, I want to change my life. I believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world because your Bible says so. That's all I got, but I'm going with it because I trust it. And Lord, I just want to see you do it in me. So forgive me of my sin, I'm asking. Change my life. Put your Holy Spirit inside of me. Lord, begin to change me. Turn me on spiritually that I may begin to want to do the things that you want me to do. And Lord, every step of the way, may I trust you no matter what circumstances come. God, I want to up or pull up everything that is unholy that doesn't need to be in my life. God, I want to have a renewed love for your word that I would know it. And Lord, I'm asking that every morning you would remind me to read your Bible. Just five minutes, Lord, let me begin to take in, to read, and to remember your word. And Father, now I am reaffirming the covenant that you have made and that I am now embracing because of my trust in Jesus Christ and what he's done. Use these things for a new me and a new year. May your purpose be fulfilled in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If this is like the moment you said, I'm trusting Jesus, man, we would love to know about it. You know, on that connection card that you filled out, you could uh, just check the back of it and put it in the generosity box on the way out. That'd be wonderful. We'd love to know. I promise we're not going to show up or anything, but we just, again, love to pray for you. And uh, we're going to sing this last song, and I hope that it will be true, like a prayer from you.
guys, have a blessed week. Thank you for coming.